Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm um, Scott Jones, um, and uh, hopefully uh, each of you had received uh, the PDF of uh, some of the wines we'll be having today, or all the wines we'll be having. Uh, and um, hopefully you've all uh, poured a glass of cava. Uh, and if not, um, now's the time to pop that cork and pour yourself a glass. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, I've got some some slides that I want to show um, just to again to kind of help give us a, a runway for what we're going to be doing today. So we have four wines that we're going to look at and we're going to start with the Cava um, from Spain. We're again going to then bump over to Oregon and look at uh, Pinot Gris. Then we're going to shoot down to California to the Central Coast and we're going to look at uh, Chardonnay and then we're going to hop back over to Spain to uh, the east side of Spain uh, and look at um, one of my favorite uh, red wines, uh, Garnacha from Spain. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're gonna go today. Uh, hopefully uh, everyone was able to get a few of those um, little uh, pairing ideas uh, to nibble on uh, while we're uh, tasting today. Um, and also I wanna interject that um, kind of when I do these, uh, whether they're for 200 people or for five people, um, I really encourage folks to be asking questions whenever you want. So um, I know most of you have, have muted your mics at this point, but please feel free to jump in at any time, ask a question. Um, this is a perfect example of um, uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I promise you, uh, this is the time to ask. Um, if I don't know it, I'll try and make up an answer that makes you sound like, makes it sound like I know what I'm, I'm, I'm saying, um, or I will be frantically um, Googling uh, um, the answer on my phone. But, uh, but seriously, um, it, the, um, that's, that's the way to kind of make this a 3D kind of experience is if you're asking questions, um, I will more than likely be asking each one of you at some point to, you know, tell me what you think about the wines, but I really want this to be a um, a real give and take. So just know that um, if I if I feel like there's too much silence, I will um, I will go ahead and raise your hand for you. There won't be a quiz at the end, but I do want everyone to try and um, participate. So, like I said, the, let's, um, um, the, what's that? Hey, the fun I, part I, is I, I appreciate, I appreciate the uh, the pronunciation on the wine from Spain because. Yesterday in uh, a store in Atlanta, um, I was trying to find the wine, and uh, the lady was like, oh, you mean Granacha? And I'm like, yeah. I don't know if that's how you sound it but, or pronounce it, but, um, but no, go ahead. Just had to say that. Yeah, so that, you know, that's, um, um, that's a, a great um, uh, stepping off, uh, or jumping off point when we get to um, talking about the red wines of Spain, because the Grenache grape is also called Grenache in France. Um, and it's a whole heated debate, but in Spain, it's Grenache. So I wanna just quickly, um, you know, again, uh, I always like um, to uh, give folks a taste of where they, where we're actually having this wine. So the, um, the cava that we're having um, is from the east, kind of the Northeast part of, of Spain uh, not far from Barcelona, actually, in, um, in the region of Penedes. And, um, you know, you obviously know other places, you know, down here in the south, you have Jerez, which is where sherry is made. Um, over here in Portugal, um, up here by the Douro River, um, that's where port is made. Um, and then if you go just north of the um, Portugal uh, and Spain border, here in Rias Baixas, uh, that's where those really light, refreshing wines like Alvarinho uh, come from. And, um, and then over here in the, in the kind of central north area is Rioja. Um, and I, I suspect that most of you have um, either had Rioja or heard of Rioja, but Rioja is not a grape, it's a region. Um, and um, I'll touch a little bit on that when we talk about Garnacha, but for now, uh, we're gonna focus on, um, on Cava. And what I want you to notice here is um, the proximity of this wine growing region 
to the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so um, many wine regions around the world ha are heavily influenced by a body of water, be it an ocean, a sea, a lake, a river. Um, all of those things are important to those, those wine growing um, areas, both um, in terms of moderating temperature and um, doing all sorts of, um, of cool things. But um, this region is, uh, is very close to uh, the Mediterranean. So the first thing I wanna do is let's look at the bottle, uh, the Frigine bottle. Um, if you have it, just kind of grab it, look at the front of it. Um, there, on the label, you're gonna see um, two words for right off the bat. You're gonna see Frigine and you're gonna see Brut, right? Yes, everyone's nodding. Um, yes. Frigine is the producer. That's the, um, the company that makes um, Frigine. They've been making um, sparkling wine in Spain since the mid 19th century. Uh, they know what they're doing. Um, Spain has had a long culture of making sparkling wine. In fact, I would say that um, every uh, significant wine brewing region in the world um, has some form of sparkling wine. Um, and Spain certainly has theirs. Uh, the other word that I want you to see is the word brut. Um, you probably don't um, often associate that with Spanish wine, but uh, anybody know where you might um, typically find the word brut on other sparkling wines? Champagne. Bueller, Bueller, perfect. Champagne, Champagne that's exactly correct. Uh, brut is a word that um, refers to the style of sparkling wine in terms of its sweetness. So um, if you look at the, at, the, at the total output of sparkling wine in the world, I'd say um, roughly 80 to 90% of all of the sparkling wine in the world is made in um, that Brut style. Brut is a, um, means it's dry. It's, there's not a um, really perceived residual sugar. It's not sweet. Um, it's not bone dry, but it's, it's dry. So anytime you see the word brute on a sparkling wine, you know that it is going to be a dry wine. And by dry, we mean doesn't taste sweet. Um, you know, you might see um, extra dry, extra brute, sec, demi-sec. All of those are giving um, indications that the wine is going to be getting progressively sweeter. But the vast majority of the, of the sparkling wine in the, made, in the world is made in the brute style. And the other thing that you'll notice on that bottle that is missing is a vintage date. Um, I, I, I would suspect that all of your bottles um, don't have a vintage date. That is not uh, a mistake. Um, we're talking it's about not, that. It's not, 18, it's not 1861? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, that was a great year. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, so, along, tracking right along with that 80 to 90% of the sparkling wine in the world that's made in a brute style. Um, it's also 90% of the, of the sparkling wine is made in a non-vintage style. So if you've ever been to a restaurant and you see brute NV on the menu, that means brute non-vintage. And that's by design. Um, champagne houses and sparkling wine houses, unlike still wines. So we're gonna make the delineation between a still table wine and a wine with bubbles. Those champagne houses and those sparkling wine houses, um, they work tirelessly to recreate the same taste and flavor and body profile year after year after year. That's what's referred to as a house style. Totally uh, antithetical to what still wines do. You know, you see a vintage date on the bottle and you hear people saying, oh, you know, the 92 was great and it was a great year. Well. In the sparkling wine world, when it comes to really fine sparkling wines, um, they um, are constantly, year after year, they're harvesting grapes, they're making wines, but they're blending wines together from different vintages to create that, that house style. So they want, to, they want to ensure that, say, the, the um, you know, Vauvetli code that your parents had when they got married tastes exactly the same as the bottle that you go and buy today. They want consistency. That's why it's very rare that you see a vintage date on a bottle of champagne. And if you do, you're gonna pay for it. Those are very expensive. Um, if the winemakers deem that um, 
you know, they've had a, a just an extraordinarily superlative year in terms of the wine grapes. Uh, they might declare a vintage, but most of the time uh, they are uh, blending those grapes to create a house style. So important to know, especially when you're ordering wine or sparkling wine in a restaurant, when you see NV, that's, that does, it's not a secret code. It just means it's non-vintage. And that's fine because most, wine, most of the sparkling wines are non-vintage. Now, further down on the label, um, the, the operative term here that you need to seek out and understand is that uh, method traditional. Everyone see that at the bottom? Yeah. Um, that is your clue that this wine is made in the traditional champagne method. So the way to think about it is that all champagne and cava, they're all sparkling wine, but not all sparkling wine is champagne or cava, okay? Champagne is champagne for a few reasons. First, it's a region, um, but the method, the champagne method, the traditional method, which is what you'll see on these wine labels, whether you get a cava from Spain, a Francia Corta from um, Italy, or a sparkling wine from Sonoma, California, it's gonna say traditional method on there. And what makes it unique is that in Champagne, and like this cava, they take the grapes, they make wine, so that's the first fermentation, and then they um, put together what's called a cuvee. They get their blend together, and they pour that blend into the bottle. They add a little bit more sugar and a little bit more yeast. They put a cap on it, and that creates a secondary fermentation in the bottle. That's the key, it's in the bottle. So, um, and that's where the bubbles come from. So when you're making table wine, they put all the grapes into the big vat and they leave the top open because one of the byproducts of fermentation besides alcohol is CO2. So when they're making still table wines, that CO2 escapes. So when they're making champagne or cava, they cause that secondary fermentation in the bottle, causes bubbles, um, they let that, those bubble, they let that wine age in the bottle. And actually there's something called Sir Lee aging, S-U-R, second word, L-I-E, or L-E-I, uh, Sir Lee aging. And that means the wine actually um, um, stays in contact with the yeast after it's spent. And that adds that um, unique richness and uh, complexity that you taste when, you, when you're having a glass of champagne or cava that's different than when you have like a Prosecco. That's made in a totally different way where it doesn't have that second fermentation, nor does it have that, that extra aging. So that's one of the things I love about Cava, that it's made in this traditional style, but it's about a third of the price and it is easy to find. In fact, um, I was getting some groceries this morning and I was at Publix and I just happened to notice that um, one of my favorite cava producers, they had, um, they had a, they had the bottles were on sale for two for ten dollars. I mean, I it was extra. I mean, I should have bought seven cases of it. Like, I mean, but it's it's rare that you spend more than ten, twelve, fifteen bucks on a bottle of cava, um, and it's easy for people to turn their nose up at at that. But what I need y'all to know is that it's a it's a it's made in the, the classic champagne style. It has that um, extra level of complexity and is really, really wonderful with food. So um, if you're new to kava, that's important to know. So um, any questions about that? We could talk all afternoon about how champagne is made, but I, I want y'all to understand it's important that that second fermentation happen in the bottle. That's where the magic is. So, so with like a Prosecco, is the second fermentation like in a vat or in a tank? Yeah, it's done in a large tank. It's called the Charmat method. You don't ever need to know that. But yeah, it's, they're done in giant tanks. And so it's basically inoculated like you might uh, carbonate a beer, a big, a big barrel of okay. beer. Um, okay. And that's not bad. Prosecco is not meant to be champagne. It's not meant to be cava. It's, it's you know, lightly effervescent. It's what the Italians call frizzante. You know, it's, it's just meant to, that's why you mix it into your, uh, you know, your um, yeah, uh, mimosas or, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like a spritzer or, um, you know, if you go to um, Venice, you know, you get your, 
your classic uh, peach nectar and prosecco. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's just meant to to be fun. It's got a little bit of um, residual um, sugar. Um, you know, it's 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 different, but yeah, it's it's made. It doesn't have the age. It's meant to be enjoyed right away. Cava and champagne both have some age on them. Um, sometimes up to you know two, three, four years in the bottle, and then could be cellared for another five, 10 years before it's released. So um, kind of a different animal, but that's what makes it so good with food. Gotcha. Yep. So let's look at the, um, let's look at the wine in the glass. If you want to pour yourself another one, um, hopefully um, you have, you still have a little bit of the bottle left, but we'll look at the, we'll look at the glass and it's always um, good to do this against a, um, like a piece of white paper or a light background. Uh, but you can notice that the, the color of the wine is, um, is, is like pale straw. It's, it's, not, uh, it's bright and, and clean and clear looking, but it's, um, it doesn't have a lot of deep color. Um, and that, that tells you um, a couple of things right away, just looking at the color of it. Um, that light pale color tells you that it was grown in a cool region. And I'll tell you why in a second. The second is that you can tell that it doesn't have a lot of oak aging or any oak aging. Those would be the first two things that you would know without even smelling the wine or tasting the wine as you would look at it and think, okay, I know this is from a cool growing region and it doesn't have a lot of oak aging. So oak aging, especially for white wine, imparts color and flavor. So think about it this way. When they make bourbon, when the bourbon, well, when the, when the spirit comes out straight from the distillery, um, it's clear like water, right? It's moonshine. Um, that clear um, spirit goes into a toasted um, American or French oak barrel. And the inside of it is toasted it just like you'd toast a piece of bread. Bread is high, high in carbohydrates, just like wood. Um, those carbohydrates caramelize, which create um, flavor and color. So if you've ever had a lightly uh, toasted piece of toast versus one that's been burnt, you know, when you, when you really burn and caramelize it, you get those bitter notes and it's real dark. The lightly toasted piece of bread, you might coax out a little bit of sweetness, uh, but not much color. And the same thing is true with wine. So when you leave white wine in contact with a toasted barrel, it makes, it creates a wine with that deeper um, yellow, more honey character. So looking at this, it's a pretty light wine probably not a lot of oak or any oak aging. Now, when, um, in terms of the cool growing climate, so um, when you grow grapes, you're looking for a couple of things. You're looking for um, what we call uh, the, the, a, a wide diurnal swing, which means you want a, a lot of temperature difference between the high of the day and the low of the night. That is critical. Um, anybody here on, on the, tasting today been to a, a wine growing region somewhere in the world? I see uh, Chris raised his hand. Joe, raise your hand. Well, for those of you who have been, one thing that you'll notice, whether you're in, you know, Napa or um, the Barossa Valley in Australia, you typically have warm days. Sometimes it can be really hot days, but at night it gets cool, very cold. Um, if you could be at, in, in Napa, you know, in September or August, and it could be, uh, you know, 100 degrees on the valley floor, but by 9 o'clock, it'll be 55 degrees. Um, that is the key to producing really high-quality, world-class world grapes. You need sunshine to ripen the grapes. Um, photosynthesis only happens when there's light. It's not related to heat. It, they need sunshine to ripen fully, and they need cool nights um, so all of the acidity that the plant is storing up for its energy needs doesn't get used. Um, if it stays too hot at night, the, the plant keeps working. So if, you have, um, if you've ever had a, a wine from Alabama or Georgia, like a muscadine wine, yeah. One of their hallmarks is they don't have a whole lot of acidity, and that's because the acidity has been burned up because it's so hot at night. You know, it's, it's not so much the daytime temperature, it's that there's very little difference. It could be 90 degrees at night, and it's 70, I mean, 
90 degrees in the day, it's 78 at night. The, the grapes never have a chance to relax. So the plant has um, um, excess energy needs and it uses acidity to do that. So by the time the grapes are ready to harvest, you have what they call a flabby wine. There's no acidity and you need acidity in wine to have balance. You need acidity in wine when you're having food. So what's that got to do with the look of this wine? Well, one of the hallmarks of grapes that come from really cool regions, still great world-class wine growing regions, but it's um, maybe they're a little closer to the water. Um, so you have this ocean influence that causes um, maybe fog or rain uh, and that cold water can keep the temperature down. Well, if they don't have enough sunlight, they don't um, get to full um, phenolic ripeness, I guess. And what happens is um, the sun during that maturation process, the skins will go from like light yellow to a darker green. So these skins and this juice was kind of light yellow, which means this wine comes from a cool region. It didn't have a chance to make really green ripe grapes and it didn't have a chance to fully ripen all the sugar that was available. But when you're making sparkling wine, that doesn't really matter. You want acidity. If you've ever gone to Champagne um, and visited Champagne, or if you look at Champagne on the map, um, it's actually at the, at the right at the cusp of being too cold to grow grapes there. Um, they really have to struggle to get enough sunshine to make uh, wine. But one of the things we love about Champagne is that crispness, that wonderful, wonderful refreshing quality. So um, think just things to know when you're looking at the wine. Um, for those of you who have a little bit more in your glass, we can take a couple of big sniffs. Um, and here, you're not looking to get like, don't overthink it. You either smell something or you don't. But I always like to encourage people to take, you know, a couple of sniffs, just see what you, what you come up with. Like I can, you know, when I'm, you know, aside from the bubbles, uh, you know, I get um, definitely get some like citrusy notes and um, green apple um, in here. Um, and there's also like this mushroomy, uh, yeasty kind of quality to it, which those sound like negative words, but it's, it's, it's kind of a hallmark of these wines that have had that um, second fermentation in the bottle. That's what gives it that richness. Um, some people um, call it, uh, refer to it as brioche. I don't know that a lot of us sit around eating brioche, so maybe you haven't had brioche, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's like um, not, not quite so sweet Hawaiian sweet rolls. But anyway, there's a, it's, it has that, that wonderful kind of fresh baked yeast roll thing. And that comes from the yeast that's made, uh, that is used during fermentation. So um, anybody else get anything when they um, are, are, smell the wine that you wanna share? Again, it's, you know, not a big deal, but. I can, I can definitely smell the apples. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm surprised by the pear and the ginger yes. that's in there. I, I don't think I can smell that, but, but definitely the apples. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good one. Um, well, I, I mean, you, again, it's, wine is such a, an unbelievably subjective experience. Um, so you may not get ginger or pear or whatever, um, but, Definitely that apple, that, that green apple um, is one of the hallmarks of the, the grape that's used in this. It's a Spanish grape called Cherlo, uh, but, in, but in Champagne, uh, the green grape is Chardonnay, which has, and we'll see in this still Chardonnay that we have, you'll really be able to kind of really smell and taste that Granny Smith apple. But um, it's, it's one of the kind of hallmarks of, of the sparkling wine. So, um, for those of you who um, can still um, uh, discern a big swig of it, let's take a sip. And uh, even though it's kind of foamy, kind of let it uh, work around in your mouth a little bit, kind of like you're, you're uh, gargling, uh, swishing your mouth with, uh, with sparkling wine. I can do that in the morning. Yeah, of course you can. And let it cover your entire mouth because like the sides of your tongue uh, perceive sweetness, the front of your tongue perceives bitterness. Um, you are, are acidity on the sides of your tongue. The top of your tongue gets sweetness. So like when you have a, a sip of this and you feel it tingle on the sides of your tongue and your mouth starts watering, that's the acidity kicking in. Um, but again, 
I definitely get a, a creaminess to this um, that comes from that, that second fermentation in the bottle, that extra aging, that complexity, and that um, it's, I, it's just creaminess that you, you, don't, you wouldn't get from something like Moscato di Asti or Prosecco because they're not made in this style. Um, and I find that really wonderful. And that's what I really love about this uh, wine when it comes to food. Um, and I definitely get a little more of that citrusy um, component to it uh, that makes it really uh, pretty lovely. Um, anybody, now that they've had a sip and they kind of got the finish, kind of pick up on that, that yeasty brioche kind of uh, feel going on, that um, kind of mushroomy quality. Yes, no. I've lost my mind. <laughs> it, it, it leaves you, it leaves you kind of like, not like dry mouth, right? A little buttery, a little, yeah, you know, that's ready, ready the, to eat something else kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you actually like, that's the, that's the headline right there is that it's the creaminess and the acidity. The acidity keeps your mouth watering, stimulates your appetite. The acidity also cleanses your palate. So if you've had a hunk of manchego cheese, all that fat that's kind of sitting on mm -hmm. your palate, the acidity, um, you know, cleanses your palate. The creaminess gives you that richness and, and full bodiness in the mouth that then, you know, whether, I mean, I, I know I recommended, I, I love, I love sparkling wine and, and like kettle chips. It's just, it's like that and cold fried chicken. I love it <laughs> with champagne. It's so good. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, like the richness of like smoked salmon or, you know, hard aged cheeses. Um, I put manchego because it's the cla classic, you know, aged um, Spanish cheese, but, you know, Parmesan, uh, Parmigiano Reggiano would also be a, a great um, match for this. Um, aged Gouda would be uh, great with this. I mean, the truth is, is um, champagne and cava um, are actually unique in the fact that you could actually pair you could have a whole dinner that was paired with just these wines. I mean, that, that's one of the uniquenesses of wines with bubbles is uh, they are, man, food and bubbles go together. It's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so um, hope you all have, have had a chance to have, continue to have some nibbles along with, um, yeah. with these wines or with this um, cava. I've had some smoked salmon with it. And I was also going to point out it's really good in the uh, workday flu. Oh, right? very good. <laughs> Very nice. I like that. <laughs> Leftover for some, some, some unnamed trade show, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So any questions about the cava or sparkling wine or, you know, why does, what's the, what, what time sunset? I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer anything. Well, it, well Scott, what we didn't tell you is that, uh, you demonstrate wine on this, this, this event here. Our job is to demonstrate software. Where when you said, if I don't know an answer, I'll make up one to sound important or sound like I do, like we are right yeah. there with you, my friend. We're, yeah, we're on very the same good. page. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Uh, well, good. Well, let's, um, let's, uh, let's move on over to, uh, to Oregon and um, I'll um, yes. let me share my screen again uh, real quick. Tim, we're switching. Okay, so can everyone see uh, the Willamette Valley? Yep. So, okay, so, you know, one of the, the most uh, often misunderstood uh, concepts um, about wines from Oregon and from Washington are, you know, everyone has um, a vision of Portland and Seattle as being cloudy, rainy, and to be sure, they are all that. Um, but what, what I need y'all to, to see here is that um, coming down from, um, uh, from BC all the way down actually to the uh, northern uh, part of California is a mountain chain, the Cascades. Uh, I, I suspect that if you've ever been out uh, to the uh, Pacific Northwest, you, you've seen the Cascades. Well, um, the Cascades, uh, provide a unique uh, geographic uh, element to Washington and Oregon that allows them to make world-class wines. So to the east or to the west of the Cascades is where you find Portland and Seattle, rainy, 
um, cold, very little sunshine, can't grow much there. Um, to the east of that um, mountain range is dry, sunny conditions. And in the case of Washington, really kind of high elevated um, desert conditions. So that mountain range creates what we call a rain shadow. So all that moisture, all that uh, really cold air is blocked by the cascade. So everything east of that gets this, um, you know, very little rain, very dry, lots of sunshine and cool temperatures, which create the perfect backdrop for growing uh, really world-class wines. Um, and so just as a little context, you can see here, Portland is um, kind of at the, the top of um, this uh, Willamette Valley. And that's, Willamette Valley is, think of it as kind of like the Napa Valley of, of Oregon. Um, it's probably, you know, in terms of most uh, travelers uh, or anyone who knows about wine or thinks about wine, um, Willamette Valley is, is easily the most recognizable viticultural area in Oregon. Um, the wine that we're having is coming from a little bit south of there uh, in Salem. Um, so, you know, what, what you'll know is that the mountain range is over here. It's, it's um, you know, it's, it's, it's blocking all of, the, all of that rain and cold weather that would otherwise be um, swamping uh, the valley. So, um, we'll, you know, again, we'll look at the bottle. Um, hopefully, uh, you guys were able to find the Acrobat or another Pinot Gris. Um, mm -hmm. for, the, for the sake of discussion, we'll okay. go ahead and point out that this has a vintage date, okay? Unlike the sparkling wine, this has a vintage date. The vintage date is the year that the grapes were picked, okay? Let me say that again. The vintage date is the year that the grapes were picked. So okay. in the case of this wine, the grapes were harvested in the fall of 2018. It went through its vinification process and... Um, and then after it was kind of probably aged in a, a big tank, um, it was put into bottle and now it's on the shelves in 2020, right? So uh, we'll see different vintages on the bottles, but just so you'll know that that's, that's what that um, uh, will tell you. Acrobat is the producer. Um, Acrobat is in terms of like good Monday night Pinot Gris. Acrobat is one of my favorite wines. It's made by another uh, it's one of the kind of, uh, I call it a JV wine from a, a wine um, company um, that makes some really high-end Pinot uh, Gris, but um, uh, the, and the wine company's King's Estate. But they, um, but you're getting the same level of of, of craftsmanship. Um, you know, when you're when you have the King Estate version, you're getting a slightly slightly tighter area of of where the grapes come from. If you'll notice on the on the bottom here. Uh, you see the word Oregon, so that means that um, uh, it, that means that um, <laughs> eighty-five percent of the grapes are coming from throughout Oregon. So it can come from any um, wine-growing region in Oregon. Um, if eighty-five percent of the grapes came from the Willamette Valley, they would put Willamette Valley on the bottom. So the majority of the fruit comes from the Willamette Valley, but some of it is sourced from outside the Willamette Valley. So they just have the word. Um, Oregon on the bottle. And you'll also notice that you see the varietal there. So Pinot Gris is the, um, is the actual grape. Okay. So, you know, again, let's do what we did with the sparkling wine. Let's look at the wine. Um, to me, it looks like there's a little bit more color to it. It's still a pretty light wine. Um, um, but um, definitely a little bit more going on than the, than the, um, the Cava. Um, and again, what we know is that we can look at the grape, um, especially when you compare it side by side to the Chardonnay and see that um, this wine has probably not had any oak aging. Um, and the fact is, is this wine doesn't. It it's, it's, um, goes through the fermentation process and the aging process in all stainless steel tanks. So they do that to cre um, keep that freshness. Yes, you can. You wanna savor that? <laughs> Go for it. Just helping out Mindy. That is like a giant uh, watermelon knife. That is amazing. Yeah, when I'm out of line, that thing comes out. I had to go yeah. get one of the kids to like open the bottle for me, but I got it. <laughs> so I was like, oh no, we can just cap this sucker. <laughs> yeah. 
Sorry, carry on. No, no, that's, <laughs> no, no, that's okay. That's okay. So, you know, let's, um, um, Mindy, now that you have a glass, um, after you chug that first glass, uh, then you can, let's, uh, let's uh, have a, let's smell and see what we, what we have here. Um, I definitely, um, I don't know what, I mean, I, I get a, um, almost a, a stone fruit, like, uh, I don't know if it's peaches or, um, and also like uh, maybe some uh, honeysuckle a little bit, maybe a floral element to it, you know? It's not strong at all. It's like real easy. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to tell it's you like an apple. That. Kind of an apple is what I kind of smell. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Um, you know, again, that's each person's going to have in their, you know, I guess it's right here in there, all the nerves uh, in that olfactory there, they're going to be able to perceive, you know, they're going to be able to connect the aromas with taste memories in their brain. And that's how our, our minds connect those things to come out with crab apple or peach or, you know, chocolate, whatever. Um, so let's, um, let's give it a taste and see what you guys think. Oops, sorry, we beat you to it. But I already, I had the salt and vinegar chips, so it's kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I, um, this is um, one of my favorite wines with spicy foods. Um, um, I love that little, it's not a sweet wine, but it has a little hint of residual sugar um, that, um, that is like if you have a spicy Indian curry, spicy Thai noodles, that little bit of sweetness helps to, um, really soften the, the, the hard edges of, of hot chilies. Um, that's why you see, um, if you're ever in an Indian restaurant or a, a Thai or Chinese restaurant, you see a lot of Riesling on the menu. Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. sweet Rieslings are there because they keep the level of the fire down from a lot of those really spicy foods. But, you know, like if you were having, a, I don't know, barbecue shrimp or some kind of Cajun shrimp dish, you know, when you had a lot of cayenne pepper in it, this Pinot Gris, would really match up with that because that little bit of sweetness would soften uh, some of that some of that fiery heat. But um, what um, what do you guys think about this one in terms of flavor? Anything that that jumps out? No, I just have a question. What's that? I just have a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Between a Pinot Grigio and a Pinot Gris. Are you? Are, is you, you must be looking at my notes, right? I mean, that's, that, that was literally the next, that was the next talking point, but that's great. Okay. Oh, oh. I'll be Ask right. your question. I, I'm not even here. No, no, that's good. That's the, <laughs> that's the, the perfect setup. So thank you. Um, okay, so this is a, a, another one of those um, examples of, of how geography and weather um, have a monumental effect on the grape. Pinot Grigio the grape, Pinot Gris the grape are exactly the same grape. Genetically, they are the exact same grape. But you grow those in a climate like the northeast of Italy in the Veneto region, which is where Pinot Grigio comes from. It's very far north. It's near a body of water. You know, you've got this uh, maritime influence. It's cold and cloudy there. So what you get with Pinot Grigio are very light, Almost, I mean, they look like water sometimes. Um, light, crisp, uh, white wines. If you take that same grape and you grow it, um, it's, it's kind of its classic home is Alsace in France. Um, but in America, you find some of the best examples in Oregon. If you take that same grape and put it in a climate where it's dry and sunny, that grape is able to ripen a little bit more, produces more color in the skins, more ripeness in sugar, the phenolic compounds in the grape are able to reach maturity, and you get this style of wine, which is still, in the world of white wines, is still relatively light-bodied. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a full-bodied wine. It has a little more umph, a little more heft than, um, say, a Pinot Grigio, but this is still considered a kind of a light to mid-weight white wine, but it's the same grape. This is, this is what it looks like when you allow that grape to have a little more sunshine and a longer ripening season. So, um, you know, that's why I I'm often recommend to people that if you're looking for an alternative to Sauvignon Blanc, consider Pinot Gris because it's like, you know, it's, it's somewhere in the middle there, not quite that same kind of bright acidity, 
you get a little more ripeness here, but um, it just plays so well with food. Um, and I mean, nothing against um, Pinot Grigio, it's wonderful, but it's when it's grown in a warmer climate um, with more sunshine, it just turns into a totally different wine. You raised your hand. I did. Yes. Um, sorry, I was a teacher for a long time. Um, so, but it seems to me when I'm in the mainstream grocery stores or whatever and just grabbing uh -huh. my very inexpensive bottle of wine, it seems like Sauvignon Blanc is definitely featured more yes. than Pinot Gris. Yes. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that from a consumer standpoint, um, the, in America, at least, um, the two best-selling grapes uh, are Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. And so we've, we've kind of been forced into, um, you know, as consumers, these two cohorts. You're either mm -hmm. going to drink the Chardonnay or you're going to drink the Sauvignon Blanc, and that's what's in grocery stores everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. This Acrobat um, I easily find at Publix, at um, Walmart, at Target. It's, it's like, it's, again, it's one of those wines that's hiding in plain sight. You, we just don't, we don't know to, to gravitate toward Pinot Gris because you don't know what's in the bottle. It's kind of weird. Is that a kind of a weird stepchild of Pinot Grigio? But, um, but yeah, you have to kind of sift through it uh, because it's true that um, just the market is flooded with, examples of Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay, but um, that's why when I do these tastings, I try and introduce varietals and wine growing regions that are easily accessible, but get you thinking about trying something different from another region. Yeah, but there's no question, you know, the, uh, a third of the white wine section is gonna be Sauvignon Blanc, two thirds is gonna be Chardonnay, and then mm -hmm you know, some little sliver in there is going to be some other varietals, but yeah, there's no question they dominate. So great question. Thank you. Yeah. Can, can you put your display back up there? Cause I got to make one little point. Yes. So, um, so not to brag or anything, but I'm from Salem, Oregon. And yeah. uh, so, <laughs> so, so I just wanted to brag a little bit. Um, because he stomped his own grapes. Yeah, I didn't stomp my own grapes. So, <laughs> so, so uh, point of trivia here, uh, just, uh, you know, kind of useless trivia, but does anybody know what that 45 means by uh, the sale in there? <laughs> pick me, pick me. Other than Kim, anybody? <laughs> Is it the angle of the biggest hill in town? I don't know. That's a great <laughs> guess. That's a great guess. Or is it like the temperature the wine should be served at? It's the average temperature for the year. Yeah, it could be that. That's actually, actually close. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's uh, actually the latitude there. So that's uh, halfway between the equator and the uh, the North Pole. And um, so anyway, that's there's correct. actually a marker when you're going on I five out of uh, Salem, going north up to Portland. And uh, anyway, so it's a little useless trivia that you might use. Uh, in no, the bar it's not useless. He is probably nothing out. He's I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna help you out there and say that. Not only is it not useless information, it's probably um, some of the most important information you could ever know about wine. Um, so, um, and I'll tell you why. So in the world, we have these um, optimal growth zones in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. In the Northern Hemisphere, it's between 50 degrees latitude and 30 degrees latitude. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's between 30 and 50. So 50 is at the top of it being too cold. 30 is, is right on the cusp of it being too warm. So what that tells you is that um, that 45 degrees of, 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 of latitude is um, about what it is in Burgundy, France. Um, if you saw back when we were at, looking at Spain, uh, Panetta is near Barcelona is at 41 degrees um, latitude. So Actually, Salem is a little bit further, farther north, which is why if you go to wine country in Oregon, the um, folks from Burgundy, you have a lot of French families that have set up uh, wineries there because it's perfect for growing Chardonnay and Pinot Noir uh, yep. because the climate's just perfect. Um, and if you go a little bit further up to Washington, it gets a little bit cooler. Now, there are obviously, you know, exceptions to the rule in terms of um, angle of slope and how in the northern hemisphere you get more sunlight or less sunlight, but really um, that's that's what as kind of wine 
you know, geeks that I, you know, like me, we are really always wanting to find out what the latitude is in terms of where the winery is, because that can tell you a lot about its ability to fully ripen grapes. So uh, 45 is, is kind of perfect. Um, again, Champagne is at, at um, 40, the 49th um, uh, latitude, and um, it's right at, at being too cold. Um, and when you get into Germany, to the Rheingau and some of the, uh, the Mosul uh, Valley areas there, those actually get up to um, 51 or 52 degrees of latitude. Um, but they actually grow all of their grapes on these insanely steep um, slopes that allows them to get double sunlight. So they get the first sunlight um, on the grapes from the sunshine, uh, partic particularly the south facing slopes, and then it reflects back off of the water, off the river, to give them uh, more um, access to sunlight. And then the slate soil absorbs that. So, you know, again, it's one of those little, um, you know, uh, outliers where it can be in an incredibly cold region, but through their um, tradition of, of grape growing, they're able to coax out um, ripeness. But when you buy a wine in Germany, you're really paying for the level of ripeness. That's how the more ripe it is, not necessarily the more sweet, but the more ripe the grape got, the more you're going to pay for it. So um, I see another hand here. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm like Me that too. kid in class that. That's just cool. Doing I this. love it. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So I grew up in Stuttgart, Germany. There you go. Which is wine country. You're yes. talking about the steep slopes yes. along the river. And the blue slate. Yes. Yes. So I was like, that was like going to be my next approach, you know, because there's a lot yes. of uh, Gewürztraminer. Yes, that's um, exactly right. So, too. yeah, a lot of Riesling. Yes, so it's their, their Riesling um, is their primary white grape. They grow a lot of Pinot Noir. Um, and um, so um, those are the two basic grapes, but that Riesling, it's, it's so, they, you know, whether you get uh, the Cabinet label uh, or level or to the <laughs> Trockenbier and Auslese, which is the highest level of German mm -hmm. ripeness. Um, yeah. Again, it doesn't have to be sweet, um, but that means you're going to get higher ripeness, which means more alcohol. And again, it doesn't, you don't, it doesn't mean you're going to get a sweet wine, but you're going to get a wine with more body, more alcohol, because it's so cold there. They actually have rules and regulations that it has to hit a minimum alcohol level. Doesn't have to, that, you know, we're not worried about that in California um, or Oregon or Washington, but in Germany, when you're that far north and even in Austria, um, they, um, they have to have rules where the grapes have to hit a uh, minimum sugar level. So once they've gone through the fermentation process, the resulting wine will have um, at least um, higher than 9%. Usually they're shooting for 10 to 12% alcohol by volume. So great, Ooh, oh, great question. I'm, so, I'm, I'm not well, going to nerd out anymore. Hey, but Mike is familiar <laughs> with that area too. I know that. You're a stallion, aren't you, Mike? Wait, what? Well, I, I mean, I, I grew up in Stuttgart when I was little, so no drinking there. Um, but it was, <laughs> it was later, another area in Germany. Uh, where Wait, the what did John began. say about a stallion? You were a stallion? A Stuttgart stallion? Uh, no, no, no. It was elementary school. Oh, okay. um, yeah, yeah. I, I went to Bill Tech for high school. So different, a little different area. Okay, because my high school, my dad taught there too. Um, with, they were the Stuttgart Stallions in Pattonville. So, yep. anyway, when I heard Stallion, I was like, <laughs> 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 Who knew okay, high school rivalries done. existed in Germany? Yeah. It's an American thing, not really. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, ready to move to California? Uh, speaking of Chardonnay, um, go ahead and um, we'll, we'll um, we're going to go to the J. Lore, and uh, I'm going to while you're opening the wine and pouring a glass, if you haven't already done so, I'm going to pull up the map again just to give some context to where we're going, uh, because this is different than Napa or Sonoma. Um, we're we're in uh, California Central Coast, and um, there are some Napa wines that I enjoy. Um, I'm probably more of a fan of wines from uh, the cooler areas of Sonoma, but I love the wines from California Central Coast. 
And Jay Lore is, um, you know, again, in terms of value price, really high quality offerings, uh, they do a, a really nice job of making wines from uh, this area. And um, since we talked about it before, you can see that both Paso Robles and Arroyo Seco are in the 36th and 37th um, degree of latitude. So um, it's a little warm in, in terms of what you might expect uh, be, with 50 being cold, 30 being too warm. But what we have here are vineyards uh, that are, uh, some of these are almost right on the Pacific. And I don't know how many of you have um, done any um, surfing or body surfing or just um, frolicking in uh, the waters near, near Monterey, but um, it's freezing it's cold. That water cold. Is, is super cold. And so what it does is it creates this wonderful um, like refrigerator-like influence um, in the morning and at night. So at night, that cool um, uh, water, uh, that, that cool moisture comes in, kind of hugs the grapes, cools them down, and then in the morning, it gets that wonderful fog that burns off, you know, by, um, you know, mid-morning. So it gets tons of sunlight. So it's, you know, again, it's, it it's sounds like on paper it should be warmer than uh, Napa or Sonoma. But it's actually cooler because there's not, you don't have that influence of a mountain range like you have uh, in uh, Napa, where you have the Mayacamas Mountains that run in between Napa and Sonoma. So um, not a... You, you're not a whole lot of that ocean influence in Napa there. So um, we're primarily looking at uh, a, a Monterey County and to a AVA there, Arroyo Seco. And so if we look at the label, uh, let me shut off my screen here. If we look at the label, you see that Arroyo Seco Monterey. So Arroyo Seco is the, is the sub viticultural area inside the larger Monterey viticultural area. So that's just telling you where it's coming from. You've got the grape here, Chardonnay, um, so you know what's in the bottle. You've got your um, vintage date, which is 2018. So you know that these grapes, like the Pinot Gris, were harvested in 2018. Uh, the other little thing that's on here that you would probably miss um, is um, Riverstone. So Riverstone is a vineyard that Jay Lore owns um, in the Arroyo Seco area. So um, it just adds a little bit more specificity and, um, you know, brings a little bit more um, character to the wine because you have a smaller um, viticulture er area that you're pulling from. So the influence is much greater than when you're creating wine from a very broad um, viticultural area. So you get that without actually having to pay the extra eight, 10, $12 um, you're still getting that at a really well-priced um, Chardonnay. So uh, let's look at the wine. Um, I hope I'm not the only one that thinks it's a little bit uh, darker than the Pinot Gris, um, but it definitely has um, some of that uh, deeper, uh, darker uh, gold influence to it. Um, and that gold uh, is, is, is what you would see and know that the Chardonnay is getting ripe and it's had some oak influence, but the only way for us to know that it has an oak influence is to smell. So let's give it a smell. What do you guys get? Anything? Anybody? Anybody come back to that Granny Smith apple? Maybe some um, vanilla? Uh, butterscotch, anything like that? Any of those? It's definitely um, not as strong. It's not as strong as, as uh, the Pinot Gris. Not as, right. as acidic. It doesn't burn your nose as much. Well, it doesn't really burn your nose. But yeah. yeah, because it's the, 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 this wine is not as high in acidity. It's, um, it's, it's comes from a warmer climate. So there's, um, it's more full body. This is definitely a full bodied wine. So let's have a quick sip and you'll feel it on your palate. It's going to feel weightier right? It's going to feel heavier on your tongue than the cava yep. and the Pinot Gris. Well, yep. that, that's, that body is because, well, first of all, it's the Chardonnay, but it's also because it it's, it's gets more sunshine. It's even more ripe. Um, so let's um, take another swig.
um, I definitely, um, I can, I can, I get some of those, that lingering influence of, of vanilla, which is, um, to me, um, some of that, uh, which, that, you know, it comes, there's actually the same uh, phenolic compound that's in vanilla beans is in oak. It's called vanillin. And so that's, that's when you, I mean, it's the same thing when you have, when you um, have a, a whiff of, of bourbon, you get that vanilla smell that's from the um, charred um, oak barrels. Um, the vanillin is, is coming through there. Um, and that's strictly from the barrel, not from the, the grains in the bourbon or the grape, the Chardonnay. It's strictly the barrel influence. But, um, but I definitely want you to feel that the, that, that mouthfeel is, is we're stepping up to a full-bodied white wine. Um, and this wine also, because it has more ripeness, um, has a little bit more um, alcohol. Not, um, you know, it's not like fiery, but it's probably, um, I reckon it's probably 13.5, something like that. Um, so I can see on here. Oh, it's 14%. So um, more sunshine, more sugar. When you make the wine, higher alcohol because they, they, um, they, they you know, during the fermentation process, they, they go till the wine is dry. So, um, but, but to me, I still get that, that Granny Smith apple, that green apple, some mm -hmm. pear, definitely some um, more um, tropical notes. And that could be from the, from the barrel as well. Um, and this is, um, um, and also I, I wanted to mention, um, you know, a lot of times when folks have Chardonnay, particularly from Napa, California style Chardonnays can be very buttery. Um, and you get that that buttery um, association with with Chardonnay, and um, I I want to I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, so the buttery um, aroma and flavor comes from a a um, fermentation process called malolactic fermentation, um, and it's um it's not like fermentation where they're like we think of where you have the grape juice you put the yeast in yeast eat the sugar, alcohol, CO2. Uh, this is more of a bacterial uh, process that happens and it converts the malic acid in the grape, which is the most dominant uh, acid in white grapes. Um, and it converts it to lactic acid, which is a much softer, more stable acid. One of the byproducts of that process of malolactic fermentation is a, is a chemical called diacetyl. Um, you, have, you don't need to know anything about diacetyl other than if you've ever been to the movies and you've had um, that pump butter stuff put onto your popcorn, yeah. diacetyl is what they use to give it the butter flavor. Uh, and so there's a reason why that buttery element shows up in your wine. Too much of it can be overpowering. Some people are just overwhelmed by it and it also is something that absolutely clobbers food. A big oaky buttery Chardonnay is very tough to pair with food because, you know, it's like trying to drive a dump truck down a sidewalk. It just, it, it's just overwhelming. Um, and so if you've ever had um, a white burgundy, so a little side note here, by law, all white burgundy is 100% Chardonnay. By law, all red burgundy is 100% Pinot Noir. So when you hear white burgundy, that's the classic, you know, traditional um, home of Chardonnay. And there it's done in a style that's much more reserved, more acidity, less oak influence, um, much more about the land, what the French call the terroir. In California, particularly in Napa and Sonoma, it's very much about, um, you know, it's much warmer there, so a lot more ripeness, but it's about making these big, bold examples of Chardonnay. One of the reasons I like the Central Valley so much and the Central Coast is the Chardonnays fall somewhere between a very traditional reserved Burgundy and that big, full body, oaky, buttery um, Chardonnay from Napa Valley. This is the kind of wine that I find is um, really much more food friendly. And um, I mean, I love this with like roasted chicken, with grilled chicken. Um, it's great with um, really rich um, cheeses like camembert. Um, you know, it's it's just a it's just a good and it's a great summertime Chardonnay too because it's not so big 
that you just feel completely weighted down by this big heavy wine. It has enough acidity, which you know, keep, you know, kind of keeps you your mouth feeling fresh, and um, it's just great with lots of food that you know we we tend to eat uh, in the summertime. Uh, fresh vegetables, um, stuff off the grill. It's just a nice a nice match. Um, and again, it's a nice departure from the traditional Napa style Chardonnay. So any, any feedback on this one? What do y'all think about this one? You know, Scott, I, I, I don't have it with me. So, but I'm, I'm very intrigued to hear, you know, to, to try it because a lot of things that you said, I guess in my early twenties, I used to love that buttery Chardonnay, right? It was yeah. just like right up my alley. It dominated. Um, I, yeah. I, it, it was, it was great. Right. But as I have aged, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And, and, you know, it just, I, I, I just can't do it. So I've been really turned on to your point around, uh, you know, Chablis and, and Burgundy. Yeah, cool climate. Where mm -hmm. <clears throat> exactly where it's much crisper, um, yep. not heavy at all. And, and, you know, where you don't have to have the white wine chilled to death to be able to have yes. some, some taste to it. Right. That is um, exactly, that's the key right there is not having to yeah. chill it down so much. Yeah. So, I, so I'd be curious. I know that, you know, I, uh, I'm curious to be able to get, to get something like this, to be able to break that in that in between and not pay a fortune, uh, yeah. for, uh, for Chablis and, and those, those burgundies. Yeah. Another, another, uh, option that you would want to look at are, um, uh, Chardonnay from Washington state. Uh, those tend to be a little more on the reserve side. Again, much cooler, long, um, long days, especially in the fall that allow for extended ripening. Um, some of the Italian Chardonnays from the north of Italy and Piedmont are really delicious. Uh, but no question, Chablis, which used to be like a, 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 a very offensive word uh, from the days of Paul Masson, um, but Chablis is really having its um, kind of a, a, a renaissance because people are getting hip to the fact that you can have these Chardonnays that are full bodied, but they're crisp and clean. And I mean, they, 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 they are refreshing versus like you were saying, um, so full bodied that you just feel like you just get that buzz that's not fun. And, um, and, they ha and, you, and you're exactly right. And, and that's, that's an, a key that I wanna I touch on real quick is, um, as consumers, we really do tend to serve our white wines too cold and our red wines too warm. Um, and both really, um, you know, kind of suck the fun out of, out of the wine. Um, if you've ever had uh, leftover pizza right out of the refrigerator uh, the day after, it's delicious, right? But you don't, I mean, but, but the cold kind of mutes the flavors of the cheese and the tomato sauce. Yeah. You put that piece of pizza in the microwave for 12 seconds and let the everything kind of warm up a little bit. You it it, it yeah. releases those flavors. If you make a cold macaroni pasta or potato salad and it's chilled, you got to add a ton of salt because cold mutes flavors. It's why we store things in the refrigerator. The cold, you know, keeps you know uh, aging and oxidation and spoilage at bay. And so when you when you serve a wine that's too cold. Um, it mutes the flavors, all that fruit, all that complexity. What you get is it tastes like uh, lemon water. You, all the, the, the only thing that breaks through is the acidity. All the freight flavors, the fruitiness, the wonderful complexity is buried by the cold. And as the wine warms up, suddenly it tastes like a totally different wine. So if you're at a restaurant, you order a bottle of white wine and they bring it to the table and there's like condensation dripping off of it, send it back because you're wasting your money. You'll have, you'll have had every drop of it before it's actually at the right temperature for you to properly enjoy it. Um, the only wine that can't be chilled too much is something with bubbles. You can't chill that too much. You, you, wanna, you, want, you want anything with bubbles to be as cold as possible. Now, on the other hand, red wine, you want to be, when they talk about cellar temperature, you know, that's really a, about 58, 62 degrees. Uh, it doesn't mean, you know, uh, by the kitchen window or on top of the refrigerator. Um, the opposite happens when a, when a red wine is too warm. All you taste is the alcohol and all you taste is the fruit. The acidity goes away. So it tastes like you're drinking a, a glass of like Welch's grape juice. All you want is like a glass of water to cleanse your palate. 
Um, and so I would say the same thing. If you're at a restaurant, you get a bottle of wine and you touch the wine and it's not like colder than your hand, um, send it back because you're wasting your money. Or, or at the very least, have them bring a bucket of ice and chill it down. Or if you're at home, pop it in the refrigerator for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, it's okay to have a little bit of, of, you want it to be cool to the touch. Um, so you can really enjoy the, the, the nuances of the wine and, and have a wine that is both refreshing and, and goes great with food. So um, Chris, thank you very much for that, that for bringing that up because it's, it's critically important. I mean, you, it, it's amazing. You can know everything about a wine, but if you get a bottle of Chardonnay that's freezing cold and you open it up, man, it's going to be disgusting. It really is. It's just not going to be any fun. So Scott, like in, in the South, like not where Chris is, where it was like probably 40 degrees this morning, and I hate you sure. for that for another reason. Um, we often like buy our wines at the grocery store, and then yeah. the grocery store doesn't have what we want, so we've got to go to somewhere else. Like how hot is too hot in the back of the car before a wine gets skunked, or like what is the, the yeah. resiliency factor there? Not much, not much, which is why they don't ship a lot of wine in the summer. So let's think about this real quick. Wine is in this glass bottle, right? So as um, uh, the wine cools and heats, it contracts and um, expands. And as it gets hotter uh, and that, um, you know, the, the wine in there is, is, is going to try and get out. And so if, as you see the, you, I mean, you've seen this in wines before probably, um, you can see where the cork has been lifted up a little bit, even if the foil is still on it. The, the, if the cork starts to lift up, you know, um, uh, give it a, a proper burial because okay. um, the wine um, will will be um, will will have gone through some um, chemical changes that will uh, not not let it show its best. Um, the, I would say candidly, the, the 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 primary enemies, the you know, the kryptonite of wine, if you will are a few things, air, um, wine oxidizes, you know, quickly. So there's like a bell curve, a little bit of oxygen helps the wine to open up. It helps release some of the volatiles in there that are the aromas that we enjoy. But then there, it gets over the top and it, the wine, I mean, the air turns it into vinegar. Um, heat is another one of those. Heat and sunshine are, um, can absolutely ruin wine. So. You want to make sure that the wine stays at a fairly stable temperature. Like you don't have to be crazy about it, like carry it around in a holster as you go around. But, you know, uh, pretty awesome, you nice. don't want to let it sit in the car all afternoon. In other words, you want to, you know, uh, you know, cover it, put it in the trunk even where there's no, where there's, yeah. at least it's not getting sunlight. Um, and sometimes the trunk is actually cooler than inside of your car that's had direct sunlight. So, um, the summertime is a little tricky, but you, you definitely want to um, limit its exposure to heat. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, was, we've, yeah, I go was ahead. Gonna say, it's an interesting choice on the cheese there, too. I'm trying that. And it, the cheese is wonderful. The, the camembert. Camembert, but, yeah. Ooh, boy, you can sure tell when it's in the house. No, you can. And you know what? It's, it's okay. You just got to, you got to roll with it. Start talking with a French accent and uh, that might make it better. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, those, that was for Chris. That's right. Um, the, the, you know, as, as they warm up, the, you know, just like the wine, as the cheeses warm up, that's when they really start to release a lot of those flavors. But um, they are really, um, even those funkier notes really link up really well with um, something like Chardonnay. Okay, so uh, uh, we have one more wine and uh, we're gonna head back to Spain and I'll just quickly um, show you uh, where, where we're going this time. Um, so we're actually not far from uh, where the cava was made in um, the Panetes region. Here, we're a little bit more interior, so it's warmer, definitely warmer than um, one of the coastal uh, vineyards here. So, um, but we're still at, at 40 degrees latitude, so very cool nights, but a little more interior, not quite as hot as it is like down here in La Mancha, but not as cool it is, as it is in Rioja, um, and um, which you have the Bay of Biscay here, and it's, that, well, the water is really, really cold there. Um, and there's a, the Cantabrian Mountains are right here that gives a little bit of a rain shadow, but nonetheless, Rioja uh, and Navarra, uh, 
um, a little bit cooler, but for me, uh, one of my favorite wine growing regions in all of Spain um, are, are right in these um, uh, regions in, in this little uh, area here, and then kind of down here by uh, the Yecla Valley, um, some really great values um, in Spain. Um, so anyway, just want to give you a little more context. So this is, um, you know, we'll look at the wine bottle here. Um, you know, La, uh, Las Rocas is the, is the name of the wine. Um, a little bit different from the other wines that have the name of the producer on it. Uh, Las Rocas is the name of the wine and the, the, um, the producer is, um, is a much larger, larger wine company. You'll see them on the back of the label, but they tend to um, let this wine kind of be the hero um, rather than um, the, the, the family name. And then below that, you see Garnacha. And Garnacha is the grape. Um, it is uh, kind of the, um, I, I call it the second most famous uh, red grape in, in, uh, in Spain. Um, the, the most famous by far and away is uh, Tempranillo. Uh, that's the, the red grape that goes into um, the wines in Rioja, Ribera del Duero, all of the, the wines that, um, that, that the collectors fuss over um, is Tempranillo. But for my money, I mean, I love, I love Rioja. I love Tempranillo. It's an amazing grape, but I love Garnacha, um, especially when it's grown in some of these cooler regions on the um, east side of Spain uh, near the Mediterranean. And, um, and so um, we talked about this earlier. Mike brought this up. Uh, Garnacha is the Spanish uh, pronunciation of the grape. Uh, if you go to France, particularly in the southern Rhone, um, down near chateauneuf de Pop, um, you find Grenache. Um, Grenache is grown all over Australia. If you see a wine labeled um, uh, GMS, uh, that's Grenache, Mavedra, and Syrah. It's a classic Rhone blend that they do all over Australia and all over the Southern Rhone. Um, and Grenache is, um, you know, a lot of people really don't understand it, but to me, um, it's one of my favorite Candidly, it's one of my favorite wines with barbecue. I love Garnacha, Spanish Garnacha and barbecue. I mean, to me, it's, it's one of like those lights out uh, pairings. But if you look at it in the glass, um, you can see it. Like if you've, if you've had a, a really rich, full-bodied um, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, that's almost uh, completely opaque. Uh, to me, this is a, a, a dark wine, but I can, there's some translucence to it. It has a some light can go through it. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be as rich and full bodied as, as say a, a big, bold uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, but it definitely has that kind of purplish uh, red hue to it. Um, and then if we, um, if we kind of check out the aroma, give it a couple of big, big smells here. You know, I, to me, I, I get um, a lot of that kind of fresh, um, uh, red fruit like raspberries, um, kind of dark cherries, maybe a little um, uh, plum a little bit. Um, but, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, and I, I would, if you, if you uh, kind of sm smell differently, I'd love to hear it, but I don't smell a lot of oak influence here. And I don't get that smoky, oaky flavor that would, that would tell me that it's been a lot of time in oak aging, but, Let's get uh, a, a sip. Or a, a sip. Yeah, I certainly don't. I get a lot I of that. Pick up a, I don't pick up a lot of the the smell of it. Or maybe it's just me. No, my sniffer's not good. Um, yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say. Um, you. I, I think you, you both just opened that bottle, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, th I think what you'll find if, if you come back to it in 15 minutes or so, a lot, you know, a lot of those aromas will have, the wine will have had a chance to open up a little bit and it'll smell uh, different, much different. Um, another, um, in addition to the temperature of the wine, a lot of these wines, these wines are real young. Um, and so they can benefit, especially the red wines, uh, from opening them up a little bit ahead of time to let them breathe a little, um, which will, just help the flavors.
but what you can do is, um, you know, without uh, swirling wine all over the, um, the kitchen, you can, um, you can swirl uh, the glass a little bit and that will help to, um, you know, get some air in contact with the wine, which will help kind of accelerate that process. But um, give it a few minutes and uh, you should get um, some more um, aromas out of it that are, that kind of identify some of those fruits, but. Interesting, I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, gorgon, the Gorgonzola has a little more smell right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Combined well, with the Cameron Bear. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. Um, what, what about like hints of chocolate, Scott? I, I, I pick up a little bit of that. Oh, Is for that sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's definitely, um, um, you can get a little of that chocolate, you can get a little cocoa, um, some of that is, um, is from the, um, uh, the warmer growing region of um, Calatayud. I mean, it's, you're going to get some of those, um, you know, kind of some dried <laughs> fruit characteristics like plum, a dried fig, uh, but you're going to get um, maybe some of that, that um, chocolate, cocoa uh, kind of influence there as well, yeah. for sure. Uh, good, good, good call. Um, the one thing that I, I, I that I find that another thing I love about this wine is it's it's fairly smooth for a red wine. You know, it doesn't have that um, kind of tongue drying um, effect that a lot of big bold red wines have, and and that's because um, um, the the tannins um, tannins are uh, a compound that are in the skins of of purple grapes, and when they ferment these wines, they keep the juice, which is clear in contact with the skins. And so the, the pigment in the skin leaches into the juice and that's what makes red wine red, but it also leaches in flavor and other organic and phenolic compounds, one of those being tannins. Tannins acts as, as a preservative. Um, and when um, you have an old wine and you see sediment at the bottom of the wine, those are the tannins that have um, polymerized and they get too heavy to stay in suspension of the liquid and they fall to the bottom. So um, that's what causes wines to have sediment and kind of lose color as they age. But tannins are what help, tannin and acidity are what help red wines age. Um, but they're also uh, the element that dries your tongue. Uh, too much or a lot of um, tannin um, gives you that kind of tongue drying effect, which is great if you've got a big you know, hunk of meat like a ribeye um, you want those tannins, but uh, by themselves, some people find it um, a little off-putting. And that's why they prefer, when they say I like soft or smooth wines, what they're telling me is that they like wines that are a little bit, you know, have less of that, that tannic presence. And to me, this um, Garnacha is one of those. Um, it definitely, I've got, you know, it's a, a good medium body red wine, but it's, but it's fairly smooth. I, I, you know, I get a little bit of that tongue drying effect, but not too much. It's a good, you know, I call this wine like a porch pounder. I could sit and drink it on the patio um, all afternoon, but I could also, you know, have this right along with, um, you know, like a barbecue pork shoulder or, um, you know, uh, a burger, pizza, you know, it's just a great all around, um, to me in the summertime, especially, it's a great alternative to a real full bodied Cabernet that's just big and you know, you, something that's just hard to drink when it's 80 degrees outside. But um, I don't know if any of you um, were able to get uh, Serrano ham or um, uh, the, um, um, you know, any other cured salami or something like that. But this is a wine that really plays well with some of those salty cured uh, meats um, are uh, really uh, wonderful with this. And Chris, to your point, Actually, um, this garnacha and um, dark chocolate, even if it's just the little um, Nestle's um, dark chocolate little things you make with chocolate chip cookies, those and a glass of this wine are a great uh, little end to dinner. If you don't have a dessert wine or you don't, you know, you want to keep on drinking the garnacha, just putting out some little um, chunks of dark chocolate in this are a great way to, to end a meal. Um, they really pair well together. That's good. I like it. Yeah. Any other comments about, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how many of you are new to Grenache or Garnacha, but um, any thoughts about kind of the texture of the wine, how it feels, um, you know, and how you would in your mind would think about how you might pair food with it. I mean, I, like I said, I think 
barbecue and burgers, you know? Yeah, I, I, I've never thought about barbecue and, and, you know, some red wine, but uh, that might be on the uh, the bucket list soon. Yeah. Uh, so go ahead and try that. Well, Mike, let me just give you um, a head start. Barbecue pork shoulder, Grenache or Garnacha. Um, brisket with like rubbed with salt, pepper, Syrah. Um, I'm telling you, if you have Syrah with brisket, Grenache or Garnacha with, with pulled pork barbecue, it, it, it'll, you'll, you'll, you'll never go back to beer for barbecue. I mean, you will. There's, it's hard to beat beer and barbecue. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> But I'm telling it's you, a ten hour cook, Scott. Right? I mean, it's ten hour. Yeah, cook. yeah, yeah. You, you can't well, you drink wine beer, for ten of hours. Course. No, you can't. You can't. <laughs> but 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 there really is. Um, they're they're a really terrific pair with with barbecue. Um, uh, so try it sometime. And um, especially if you've got like a chow chow on top or like a creamy oh. coleslaw on the slide, on the side. Um, you know, this Grenache is just dynamite. Really great stuff. Yeah, like the uh, yeah. the thing that I was. Picking up with like I have some salami here, like the the bitterness yes. of the salami, like really like says hello, right? So like a not like a really yes. sweet barbecue sauce, but almost like a Carolina barbecue sauce would be really, that's really a, good with that. Yes, yeah. yeah, something that's got a little more vinegar to it, yeah, um, a little more bite, uh, not so much sugar. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a it's a great great suggestion. Yeah, they mm -hmm. they really um, you know, again, I you could have a. a a Domino's pepperoni pizza or a Stouffer's lasagna that you yank out of the oven. Um, this kind of wine, because it's got good acidity, it's got a good balance of, of fruit and body, uh, very soft tannins, um, just make it a real uh, food friendly wine. And in fact, um, I have a lot of friends um, that uh, we prefer uh, wines from the Southern Rhone or from uh, Spain uh, at Thanksgiving where they're mostly Grenache because it just plays so well with lots of different flavors. So whether you have, I don't know, a uh, sweet potato casserole or uh, stuffed pork loin or roasted turkey and all those textures and flavors, red wines like this really um, are able to kind of ride the roller coaster of all those different things going on at a, at a big, you know, holiday table. So good to remember. Yeah, and I love the way you roll, man. <laughs> I love the way you roll. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I think we've gone uh, a few minutes past our time, and I, I want to be respectful of your time. But I'm I'm happy to to answer any other questions that you might have, or um, I I will I will say this in closing. Uh, let me share my screen again. Um, uh, if you, um, I, I put out every couple of weeks a newsletter to my mailing list, which um, I try and identify, again, easy, readily available uh, value wines, primarily under $12 that are available at grocery stores, Costco, Aldi, your local wine shop. Um, if you're interested in, in signing up for that newsletter, you can reach me at scott at joneseisthirsty.com. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been doing these um, virtual uh, wine events for the public um, every two weeks. The next one is on September 19th. We're going to be looking at Italian wines. Um, so if you want to um, get information on those events, feel free to reach out to me. I also post a lot about those events and my wine recommendations on uh, my social media accounts, mostly on Instagram and Twitter at uh, Jones is Thirsty. And um, if you're ever so inclined to uh, feel moved to uh, um, uh, donate to the virtual tip jar, uh, I'm at, um, at Jones is Thirsty on, uh, on Venmo. But um, uh, definitely keep that email address. If you ever have any questions, uh, my friends are shameless about texting me at 9.30 on a Thursday night. They're out. Um, at a big fancy dinner with a table full of clients and they send me a text with the wine list on there. Like, what should I do? Um, uh, I get um, FaceTimed all throughout the day and night with my buddies walking through wine stores, just holding up the phone and like yeah. walking me down the aisle. So if you ever have any questions, honestly, it's, I love answering the questions. A few things make me happier than having folks that are feeling more empowered about 
uh, buying wine and enjoying wine. So, so please, um, you know, if you're, I don't know, uh, whether you're planning a wedding or you're trying to find a good wine with your, um, your Stouffer's lasagna, uh, definitely, um, feel free to, um, to reach out. I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, help where I can. That's great. We appreciate it. Thank really you. Good. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I, I, I hope that our paths cross again at some point in the future, but uh, in the meantime, I hope you all stay uh, happy and healthy. And um, luckily, uh, I hope none of you have to drive. Hopefully you're in the comfort of your own home. And for those yeah. uh, in Atlanta, it's now uh, 540, so you can officially start uh, enjoying wine in earnest now. So I hope you all have a good rest of the day and um, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. It's awesome. Bye. You're very welcome. Bye-bye.